from the Silicon Valley Media Office in Boston, Massachusetts. It's the Cube. Now here are your hosts, Stu Miniman and Dave Vellante. Hi everybody, this is Dave Vellante with Stu Miniman. We're here at the East Coast offices of SiliconANGLE Media. This is the Cube. We got a special conversation that Stu and I are going to have. Stu has been a big week. He had the EMC uh, acquisition by Dell actually went through officially and, and HPE did another spin merge. Seems like a popular technique that uh, Meg Whitman and company Wait, are using. Wait, Dave, I thought we're here to talk about the iPhone 7. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, CNBC's got that covered. <laughs> okay, absolutely. Continuous coverage of iPhone 7. Non-stop Apple all the time, <laughs> absolutely. Yet another phone for <laughs> 1200 bucks. But we digress. So yeah, so big week, Stu, and we are entering a new era of enterprise uh, technology. I mean, let's start with the uh, with the the Dell acquisition of EMC. It, it it took felt like it took a long time, but actually didn't really feel like it took a long time. If you know what I mean, it was many many months. It was Columbus Day last year yeah. that they announced it. Huge acquisition, so it's not surprising that it took many many months. But um, it happened. Uh, it's pretty much on schedule. China delayed things a little bit. We'll talk about that, but um, what do you think? New era. Yeah, I, I mean, Dave, I remember when we heard the rumor first, I was actually at Amazon reInvent. So kind of ironic that we were at the Amazon show when we heard it. Um, John Furrier was like, no way. And we were like, well, maybe. And John said, absolutely. He you know, sees where everything's gone now. And less than a year, just as they said, a uh, lot of hurdles they had to go through. I mean, huge financial. I mean, Dave, the industry's looked at this. I know you've dug into it. Um, we've had conversations with Michael Dell and many people. Just a, a deal of this size has so many pieces. Um, when we did Dell World, I said, the problem is, is people are trying to get figure out the chess moves, and Dell's not showing you their board. So, you know, SecureWorks is IPO'd, things that they're selling off, the services piece. There were, you know, many major pieces that moved to be able to make that financing, financial uh, stuff go into uh, action. Um, I, I got a good ed education on tranching. Um, so, uh, you know, how, how they were doing all the bonds and everything like that. And uh, the glo geopolitical politics that goes into this. The U.S. need to approve it, European uh, Union need to approve it, and then China was the last last one that needed to prove it, and the stockholders. So, so many pieces to make this historical event happen. And, uh, you know, kudos to that team because uh, it seemed to go, you know, mostly as planned, uh, you know, no major roadblocks. Uh, it's not like they had to make any major changes on the deal or, uh, you know, n no white knight came in and said, oh, we need an extra billion dollars or two to come in there. Um, they, they moved it along. Well, so to, the, to your point, it is a historic deal. And the fascinating thing to me, Stu, is is like the brilliance of Michael Dell. He and his partners at Silver Lake, they put up only, I'm going to say only, but only $4 billion. Now, Michael's a multi-billionaire. Silver Lake obviously has resources, but they only had to put up $4 billion of their own cash to get uh, uh, what is now a $74 billion company, according to the 8K that uh, Dell filed yesterday. The notes of that $74 billion, by the way, uh, say that's the unaudited figure as of January of 2016, but still. 70 plus billion dollar company, $4 billion in cash, you know, for, for a multi-billionaire. So how'd they do it? Well, they did it with a lot of really interesting, as you say, moving parts, you know, the tracking stock, um, uh, 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 raising some debt, delevering in the process. Ray Wang had a comment in uh, the post that those guys wrote that he was concerned about, you know, for EMC customers spinning off all these assets. I, I am, I'm not as concerned. I mean, the core of, of EMC is, is intact, uh, but the organization now is interesting. So Michael Dell didn't waste any time. They filed a, a many board actions yesterday with the SEC. They are immediately officially Dell Technologies Inc. EMC emails have already changed, right? So they're ready for this. So, but organizationally, it's quite interesting what's going on here with David Goulden in charge of enterprise. Well, talk about the organization a bit. Yeah, so, so David, you said, um, they moved really fast on some of these things. Uh, I live in Hopkinton. I worked on South Street for 10 years, and there's already Dell EMC signs up. As a friend of mine inside EMC said, well, you know, we had a year to plan this and, you know, a long holiday weekend uh, to, to roll it out. So new signs, new mulch, 
um, and David Golden's in charge. So, you know, so many people are like, oh, you know, they're selling off EMC or doing this. It's like, no, you, you know, that's not Michael's plan. He, at VMworld, when we interviewed him, John, John Furrier and I interviewed him, he said, first of all, you know, VMware, I'm not selling it. It's crown jewel, absolutely huge part of what we're doing. From a Dell's EMC standpoint, Dell EMC is the corporate brand. That's what they're selling to enterprise users. And not only is it all the assets that EMC had, but the traditional Dell server and networking group. So, uh, you know, Ashley who runs the server group, Tom Burns who runs the networking group, they report to David Golden. So, it's interesting as we've looked at this, there's parts of it that says, wait, who's acquiring who? The whole enterprise brand, which is, you know, a big piece of this, is David Golden. David's been running the EMC II, you know, part of the business under Joe Tucci for uh, the last few years. Uh, he was kind of the, you know, heavily in involved in, in the, the whole federation piece. Uh, you know, you, Dave, you, you've known Dave, Dave Golden for a while. Um, he's been doing a, a great job with it, and now he has, a, you know, a big piece of Dell Technologies. Uh, Marius Haas gets the commercial side of things. Uh, Jeremy Burton's the CMO uh, over the whole uh, Dell Technologies, and uh, most of the senior leadership people are still in place. Uh, and you know, of course, there's uh, there's already rumors of uh, you know what was it another two or three thousand people are going to be laid off out of a hundred and forty thousand uh, people altogether. So there, there's some things moving around and, and, and changing, but uh, you know they all have the Dell email addresses. I hear they can all communicate internally via Skype, uh, and uh, you know there, there's there isn't a lot of uncertainty internally as to who's running what and where things are going. Well, everything enterprise, my understanding, is Dell, branded Dell EMC. Uh, Billy Scannell will be repping Dell client technologies. Everything uh, uh, consumer and client is going to be branded Dell. Right. Uh, and that's sort of the, the, the split. And then there's a whole bunch of stuff, you know, in between the federation pieces, you know, RSA and Pivotal, they still sort of exist as divisions. Pivotal obviously you know, going to be spun off at some point, presumably anyway, to do an IPO, and we'll talk about that perhaps in a bit. I want to come back to the deal. I want to talk briefly about, well, let's talk about competition first of all, because you can't talk about Dell EMC without talking about HPE. More news this week, uh, HPE did a spin merge of its software asset, uh, basically uh, to a company called Microfocus, which is a Golden Gate Capital roll-up of a bunch of different software companies. HP shareholders will hold 50.1% of the company, but HPE will not own that. So uh, it's sort of one of those interesting, probably highly tax efficient deals. Um, but HP is getting $2.5 billion in cash, uh, and then a 50.1% shareholders, a 50.1% ownership in this m entity. Um, just sort of rough math, uh, rough arithmetic, HP probably paid about 20 billion for all those software assets comprising Autonomy and Vertica and Mercury Interactive and, and ArcSight and et cetera, et cetera. 20 billion down to 2.5 billion in cash, not a good return. HP software business has not been growing. You know, I've been saying for years, they've got to you know, get their act together in software. Looks like they just gave up. So, question I have for you, Stu, is, is HPE now focused on infrastructure? Is that, notwithstanding Amazon, is that the main arms dealer competitor to Dell EMC, Dell Technologies? Yeah, I, I think absolutely it is, Dave. I mean, Meg Whitman was on the uh, financial shows this morning talking about how she believes that they are, they, they HPE are more agile uh, and focused and have a better solution stack uh, than Dell and Dell EMC do together. Uh, Michael Dell and the whole EMC, Dell EMC team, of course, have their sights set on crushing HPE, as they've said. Uh, they think they've got the best solution. So uh, we've been watching, I mean, how many decades now, Dell and HP going af after each other with server as the core and the, the foundational layer for everything that goes on top of it. Um, so it's going to be interesting to watch. Dave, just a quick question for you because, uh, you know, we've been getting this education, you know, we've got the tracking stock on the VMware piece. Um, this is the second spin merge uh, that HP's done. They had the CSC services. Why do they do this as a spin merge? What, what, what is that, why does so that make sense? I, I think they do it because it's a, it's a, it's a tax neutral uh, 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 move and they maintain ownership in these entities that they spin into. Uh, so as a result, they get the benefit of you know, long-term growth or whatever you know, uh, uh, value can be created there, uh, and they don't get taxed on it. And they get the further benefit of taking these non-core assets and you know, getting rid of them. I mean, 
You know, HP, it's, this is the dismantling of a Silicon Valley icon. I mean, and it started when Carly, Carly Fiorino wanted to buy PwC. And she wasn't able to get that deal. IBM ultimately ended up buying PwC. It was a transformative move for IBM um, at a much, much lower price than Carly was willing to pay. But Carly wanted to go, uh, you know, do a big uh, acquisition. She ended up with Compaq. Now, Compaq was okay, but it was very controversial. Members of the board, you know, the, from the Packard or Hewlett found, uh, uh, family, I can't remember now, were fighting it tooth and nail. Uh, and, and that set in motion a whole new series of mega acquisitions, including EDS, which Heard orchestrated, which was pretty, not a great acquisition. It was a boat anchor acquisition for, for uh, HP. It heard thought that they could replace all these IBM mainframes with HP servers, and when it ended up happening, is IBM sucked up back all the business that was up for renewal. So that didn't work. And so now you're seeing Meg having to come in and clean up that mess. And we didn't even talk about autonomy. I won't even go there. But Meg's just getting rid of all these assets that weren't performing, and the way they were they're doing it is to get some cash, helps clean up the balance sheet, and do these spin mergers, which gives them ownership in these new entities. They still own a part of the CSC entity. They own a big chunk, obviously, of this microfocus entity. So they're very, very tax efficient. Now you're left with an infrastructure company, so they've gotten rid of non-core assets, security, non-core, which surprised me. I mean, I'm not surprised because I, they had to get rid of security to get the price that they wanted, the 8.8 .8 billion of value, but it's only 2.5 billion of cash only. Um, so now that we're left with a pure play infrastructure company, I've been saying for years, we've been talking about on theCUBE, you and I and John Furrier, HP's got to shrink in order to grow. Well, it's shrunk. Question is, can it now grow and how? Yeah, that, that's a great question, Dave. I mean, we, we've looked at, uh, and we were talking at VMworld, Pat Kelsinger laid out how public cloud is just eating a big part of the market. Um, his numbers were reached kind of you know, the majority in five years. Um, you know, I, I think we can all argue as to what percentage and what year, uh, but you know, reasonable people understand that public cloud is growing and that is a threat. Uh, if, if you say Dell and HPE, at its core, if they're selling less servers, uh, that's a challenge to their overall business. At its core, that's what they need to do. Um, and the addressable market that they have going forward seems to be shrinking over time. So uh, how do you keep growing if your core business is shrinking? So there's been a 10 year, we talk about this a lot, a 10 year slow motion collapse in infrastructure, hardware, and software pricing and it's due to, to open source software and cloud. So we've seen the difficulties that, that companies are having, even these open source companies, look at Cloudera, look at Hortonworks, um, uh, and, and others, of really driving new market growth. Now Cloudera is private, and they've got a big chunk of cash from Intel, so it's hard to tell exactly what's going on there, but you know, they're not setting the world on fire to the point that we thought they would you know, from, let's say, five years ago. And Hortonworks is a you know, public company, we see the financials there. So the open source software business has always been very hard. Red Hat's really the only you know, exception to the, to the rule of it's, you know, why buy the cow when the milk is free? Um, but, but so uh, when you look at the effects of that with Amazon and open source software in particular on the infrastructure business, something had to give. So we're now entering this new era of enterprise tech where you've got Amazon as the l low cost, high margin provider, uh, and you've got Dell with EMC now, and HP as the arms dealers to the cloud. Without a public cloud, you know, own ownership of a public cloud strategy other than, I guess, you know, VirtuStream and vCloud Air, Redux 3. We'll talk about that in a second. So you've got this clash of a former Titan in HPE, with the slim down former Titan. You got the new Titan now, Dell Technologies, uh, and then you got you know, Amazon kicking ass as, as we know. How do we see, you guys at Wikibon, us at Wikibon, how do we see this shaking out over the next five to 10 years? So, uh, it's an interesting challenge, Dave, uh, because, well, I, I believe, you know, if, I, if I look at the Dell EMC and that, that whole Dell Technologies, um, They've got pretty clear how they're going to sell to the hyperscale guys. Partnership with Microsoft is really important. How they interact with Amazon uh, is, is kind of shaping out. Uh, you know, VMware had an announcement with IBM and what they're doing with SoftLayer. Uh, don't put them quite in the, the same category as Amazon and, and Microsoft, but you know, the, trying to figure out that, that whole second tier of service providers, and uh, IBM, of course, has some large cl cloud revenue. 
Uh, but you've got the hyperscales, you've got your traditional data center, um, and you know what that balance and that shift over the next couple of years is going to be really interesting to watch. So, um, you know. I'm comfortable with the strategy that Dell Technologies has. Uh, as a matter of fact, Lenovo has a very similar strategy to kind of come up. They've got uh, you know strong presence in Asia, uh, and uh, you know don't have as much of a legacy uh, to try to you know hold on to. So uh, they can cut costs on the one hand uh, and push into some new markets. Uh, HPE, I don't feel that they've. Uh, kind of cut, they, they've started to cut down, but they, you know, don't have as clear of a strategy as to how they, you know, go to adopt in the new hyperscale space, how they defend uh, their existing environments, uh, and, you know, manage that transition. Another wild card is China. Yeah. Nobody's talking about the effects of China. Uh, Huawei in particular, Lenovo uh, as well. And it's no, it's no coincidence in, in my view that China slowed this deal down. Um, uh, when we talk to executives about it, they say, hey, you know, we got the deal done on time. Okay, I get that. That's not the angle, in my view, anyway. China wants to be self-sufficient. It's going to have, by the end of the decade, it's got its own microprocessors. It's got its own Linux operating system. It, 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 it claims, I don't know, some large number of the world's top 10 supercomputers. Um, so China wants to be self-sufficient as a technology powerhouse. So my view is that that China was demanding concessions of Dell, and they probably got them, I'm sure they got them. We don't know what they are. Um, but likely they were designed to slow Dell technologies down. Uh, and so we don't hear much about China. You know, there are Huawei's we got restrictions in, in, in terms of selling to the US government, you know, for example, which is a huge component of the business. But Everybody's eyeing China because it's such a huge market. What's your take on all yeah, this? Yeah, I mean, Dave, in, in my network, uh, the, the work that China has done on, say, the, the latest uh, processors has my network buzzing. So, specifically, the U.S. government told Intel, don't ship the ne next generation of chips there um, because we're worried about, uh, you know, both competitive and secrecy and everything like that. And China said, fine, we'll create our own microprocessors. The fastest supercomputer in the world right now is made with China chips. And I think it's like four out of the top 10 or 20 yeah, yeah. are Chinese made uh, devices there. So we know, uh, you know, China and the ODMs in Taiwan have been taking chunks out of the server market. Um, you know, seeing some of these options with, with the chips there. Uh, Huawei, from a networking standpoint, uh, the joke I had is that John Chambers in his last couple of years, uh, he had two things he was trying to do. Number one is he was, uh, that he was doing with the U.S. government. Number one is he was trying to be able to repatriate all of his foreign money. And number two, he was trying to keep China out of the U.S. and our partners' markets. And they did a better job on keeping China out than they did at repatriating the money. Uh, but China is definitely a threat. Uh, to the networking business, and it only makes sense that storage is kind of the third leg of that stool for infrastructure. Uh, you know, the, the China has a huge internal market, and they try to capture that, uh, and as well as they want to supply the rest of the world. So, you know, Huawei's huge player. Uh, there's a number of other players, and, and the government uh, definitely has, you know, interest in controlling that market and keeping out uh, what would be the largest player in the space, which is Dell plus EMC. Strong local demand and strong local competition are two ingredients to global powerhouses, and so China's obviously one to watch and, and a wild card. Amazon, I think people are beginning to understand, even though you know there's more to come. We, we maybe talk about that some, but China's sort of interesting. I want to come back to HPE. Does, what does HPE need to do now? Does HPE need to make um, another acquisition? Does it need to buy a, uh, a, a Nutanix? Uh, and acquire them, or does it need to do some tuck-ins on like, you know, an Iguaz or a, or a Datrium, one of these sort of new wave uh, uh, hyperscale types of, of companies. W what does HPE need to do, or does it just need to keep going along and, and investing in, 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 in Helion? Yeah, so, so, you know, right, what wave is HPE going to ride? So, you know, virtualization, uh, the server division did real well, driving VMware, uh, they were a great OEM, they did a lot there. Um, they've, the storage division's done pretty well, especially with the three-par acquisition. Um, but, you know, is containers the next wave? Is IoT a big wave? We see Hitachi uh, data systems, you know, big focus on IoT with what they're doing there. Huge impact on infrastructure, um, and that could be player. I know you, you've talked with HPE plenty about that. 
that. Uh, uh, analytics was one that seemed to make a lot of sense, but now you know maybe that's non-core as to how they push that. So um, you know. Obviously, they have to have, you know, I, I think the line was, HPE is not getting out of software. They're just, you know, getting out of the non-core oh, piece. Please. So, uh, I mean, but, but it, it was, seen that line, but it, 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 it definitely HP gave up in software. It definitely but worried me a little bit because, you know, I need that, right, you know, security, analytics, you know, IoT, uh, you know, you got to be in at least a couple of those right now. Otherwise, what's going to drive your infrastructure going forward because of the big waves that are driving, you know, all the connectivity, all the storage, uh, all the devices. I mean, I, I'm, I'm saying HP gave up on software because we're talking about uh, you know a software business that is you know non-recurring engineering costs that you go you drive you know marginal economics yeah. versus one that's tied to somebody's infrastructure. I, I, I mean, and if you're saying okay, well, our, our software is going to run on on standard commodity servers, but we're going to be able to get the kind of you know margins that we have historically. Out of, out of you know our infrastructure software, our SDN and our yeah. SDDC, I, that's going to be a, a, a big challenge. You know, you're, that's why the Dell EMC deal to me was inevitable. Amazon's operating profit is in the mid twenties. You know, EMC's this is this is non-GAAP. EMC's lucky if it's in the you know high teens, right? So they're more profitable and ostensibly less expensive. So this trend is not going to go away. You know, Amazon's not just going to disappear. They're going to keep, in my view, keep getting stronger and stronger and stronger. Yes, hybrid, I get that. Data locality, I get that. But this, these are winner take, takes all markets, generally speaking. Um, does that change? I mean, is it, obviously big market. You know, there's room for everybody and, you know, these guys aren't going to just roll over and say, okay, Amazon, you know, take me to the cleaners, but Amazon is cleaning up. Yeah. And, and Azure is in a good position. Google, we can you know debate. You know they're trying to get get back in the, in the game with Diane Green at the helm. It's kind of you know interesting there. But the 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 volumes and the efficiency that those three companies are driving, Google, Amazon, and, and Microsoft, compared to what the enterprise guys can do, it's scary. So that as a result, you've got to have lower costs. Hence the cost restructuring, the delevering going on at Dell, and then again you got China. So how's it all shake out, Stu? Does 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 HPE in particular have to make a big move? So, uh, you know, what they don't have that Dell Technologies has is the rest of that, what used to be the Federation, Dave. So, uh, Dell Technologies, it's got VMware, it's got Pivotal, uh, it's got a few paths as to where it's going in the future, and I don't see that in HPE. So, but, we but maybe that's a good thing. VMware's legacy, you know, you've, you've been saying that. You guys talked about yeah, that. Yeah, VMware, VMware might be the new legacy. That might be the new legacy, but it still has, you know, it's still dominant in its market share there. Uh, it 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 does not have the applications, but it still pulls pulls you up the stack a little bit beyond just the infrastructure, which is still, you know, if the hypervisor's commoditized, isn't everything underneath it uh, even more commoditized? It's, it's got obviously a big customer base, but didn't VMware capitulate when it basically said, okay, we're going to do this, you know, what John Furrier calls interclouding. Um, I know you don't like that term, but, but basically we're going to be the manager of the clouds, right? As opposed to, we're going to dominate the cloud market. They tried to dominate the cloud market, they failed. They've tried now a couple of times. Um, you know, we haven't talked much about IBM. Uh, actually, let's, let's park that for a second. <laughs> we, we kind of don't have much time, <laughs> right? But, but so, is that interclouding? What I'm calling the interclouding strategy, going to allow companies to you know maintain their relevance? Yeah, and or are they traffic cops? And HPE has has gone that there. There's management that they can do there. They tie into especially you know HPE is going to say you know we're as good as uh, of a partner with Microsoft as Dell is. Um, they're, they're both you know big importance there, uh, and they're going to tie into the big public clouds. Um, I've seen HP go through even more uh, churn on their cloud uh, than we have kind of the VMware and the EMC standpoint. Uh, EMC kind of understands where they sit on the infrastructure. They've still been growing kind of their converged and you know pushing hard into the hyper-converged marketplace. Uh, HPE has developed a bunch internally. Uh, you know, might they make make an acquisition? There's been plenty of rumors. You mentioned Nutanix a year ago. There was a rumor they were going to buy SimpliVity, um, but you know they didn't pull the trigger on it. Uh, there's a number of things. I mean, Dave, we could be sitting here today saying that HP finally finished the acquisition of EMC if Meg had pulled the trigger. Uh, you know, yeah, two two years ago, like we had to heard. That fire. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, other other things that we're seeing. We just put out a service in report, basically saying you know the traditional block and file. SAN and NAS business is 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 peaked, 
and is going to decline over the next 10 years. I mean, when it first came out, we got some blowback on that. I think there are a lot of people who now kind of agree with that. You're seeing the spending pattern. Yeah, every, so this third year we've done this this research, Dave, and every year it's, uh, uh, I'm not sure I don't like some of your charts, and they dig into the data and they're like, oh, and this looks good, and uh, maybe a year or two out looks okay, but you know, forget it, three years from now, you guys are way too aggressive. Well, it's the third year that everybody mostly agrees with what we put out this year, um, so you know, we, we think we've been pretty active, uh, accurate on the trend as to, to where it's going. And you got IoT pushing at the edge, you know, pun intended. You've got, you've got virtual reality now, and you've got companies like NVIDIA, you know, with, you know, calling into question the, the ability of traditional microprocessors to, to, to keep up. Um, you know, certainly the big data, while there aren't a ton of, ton of pract uh, uh, vendors making money, a lot of practitioners are doing really well in, in, in big data. So that's a huge, huge trend. The mobile, you know, wave has hit. So you have all these disruptions. Wither the traditional enterprise business. I mean, we've got a whole new era here where you've got Amazon and Microsoft, you know, dominating Microsoft, leveraging its estate. Amazon with the new disruptive business model, and now you've got basically HPE and uh, and 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 Dell duking it out for arms dealer leadership. Yeah. Is is there, is there growth potential there? So, I mean, Dave, we, how many years have we been saying that, you know, users that want to get control of what they're doing need to get out of that undifferentiated heavy lifting and be able to add more uh, value back to the business? It's, it's, it's been many years we've been saying that, and we're starting to see, you know, significant shifts into how IT does things, and that means they're not managing that infrastructure as much. Uh, they purchase it, it, it's, it is more shrink-wrapped, uh, it is more automated, um, and, they're not worried as much about some of the you know bits and bytes inside. Of course, you still need to have your domain expertise. You need to make sure you understand how your applications work in your environment and where you have competitive differentiation. And we still see people you know striving hard to you know hold on to anything that they've got that differentiates them, even if they're using things like Amazon. Um, but you know it, it does make a shift as to uh, you know where that conversation's happening, where the budget flows, uh, and you know the relationships that they're having with, uh, you know, tends to be a smaller number of technology partners. And we, we haven't talked about Oracle and IBM, and we don't have enough time, but those guys, to me, anyway, Stu, are largely software companies. They're, you know, IBM with its analytics push and its, and its cognitive push, Oracle, obviously, database, and, and, and its SaaS business. That's what's driving their business, not infrastructure. Infrastructure is, you know, something that they're doing to try to, you know, drive down cost. In IBM's case, I keep the mainframe, it's, it's very profitable, but, you know, IBM's you know future is in in software and in, in artificial intelligence or what they call cognitive. Oracle's future is in SaaS. Um, those are different businesses than what Dell and 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 HPE, what's left of HPE now, are in. So that's sort of outside this little core infrastructure discussion that we're having. I'll give you a final thoughts, Stu. Um, Say, it's been a big week, although no huge surprises. These were ex both expected in the case of Dell EMC and. A, a poorly kept secret in the case of HP. It's been known for you know months now that they're going to be doing this. So. Yep, the death of the headphone jack. Oh wait, we're still not talking about Apple. Sorry, <laughs> um, but uh, I, I was having a conversation online, and we're talking about. I mean, Dave, you remember the the four horsemen of the internet era? It was you know Sun, Oracle, Cisco, and EMC. And uh, you know Sun's gone, EMC it's now Dell EMC. The two's gone. Their 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 the, their names after Michael Dell's. Uh, up on all the buildings on their business cards, and they've got Dell email addresses. Uh, and you know, the four horsemen of the internet era, it's you know, Apple, Facebook, uh, you know, it's Google, and Amazon. Facebook, so. a Apple, Google, and Netflix. Yeah. <laughs> a practitioner changing you yeah. know, business, and maybe throw Uber and Airbnb yeah. in there. Amazon's there, so. And, and, and Amazon as well, yes. Oh, I said Apple, yeah, yeah. right. Forget no, but it, it thought it's Apple and Amazon, Fa so. Fang, Facebook. Apple, Google, and Netflix, and right. yeah, throw Amazon in there too. Maybe it's Fang. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, all right, Stu. I mean, you know, there's been some good pieces. Gil Press wrote a great piece on the you know short history of EMC. Yeah, Dave, come on. You, you've known EMC since they were getting beyond mainframe and going to storage. You know, what, what does this mean to you? Of kind of well, you know, a lot of people are nostalgically looking back at, at EMC. I, I you know, I say it. EMC's gone. I mean, it, digital equipment is gone. Digital equipment was bigger in its day than EMC. Sun was pretty big in its day. Those companies are gone. They're not, they're, not, they're not relevant anymore. Nobody's talking about them. This is Dell Technologies. EMC as we know it is gone. The Federation failed. It was a great try. 
you know I have you know great respect for EMC and 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 have a historical perspective as well. But to me, it's all about looking forward. And this is a new era. And the, you know the days of 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 the you know the storage model that EMC invented. Um, you know, both started the mainframe and then moved into so-called open systems and drove 60% plus gross margins and tons of cash flow for years and years and years are, are, are done. You know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's interesting to look back, but frankly, I'm more interested in looking forward and talking about how customers should be placing their bets. And customers are placing their bets and they're hedging those bets. And you know, in some respects too, I think it's somewhat easier when the industry is consolidated like this. You know, I think Amazon's a pretty safe bet for the right use cases, even though a lot of people in the enterprise want to scare you. And I think, you know, uh, that, that Dell Technologies is a pretty safe bet. I think HPE is a very customer focused company. And if you're an HPE customer, you're going to be okay, you know, sticking with those guys. And obviously Microsoft and Cisco and some of the other big members of the, of the cartel. Um, now where it gets tricky is, okay, what about Google? What about these other clouds that are emerging? Where should I use those? So, complexity is still there. And then what about innovation? You know, where's that come from? And still coming from the valley, maybe that's why people are ignoring China. Um, but what EMC means to me is another East Coast mini computer company. I mean, essentially, that's what, you know, they were, they were the, the progeny of East Coast mini computer companies failed to survive. And as an East Coast person, that's too bad. You know, maybe IoT will change that, but Silicon Valley remains the center of innovation in our industry. And that's why I'm happy that we have a bi-coastal company. <laughs> All right, Stu, again, I'll give you a last word. All right, so yeah, I mean, Dave, we've been saying for years that storage is looking more and more like servers. Well, you know, the biggest storage company is now working for a server company. Uh, so, you know, it might be the death of the EMC Federation, but, uh, you know, I know the people on Tau Street are going to say, long live Dell Technologies and Dell EMC. Yeah, that's what they should say. So, and we're excited to have theCUBE bringing you uh, all these trends. We, we, we cover the enterprise tech. theCUBE is the worldwide leader in enterprise tech coverage and live tech coverage as well. So really appreciate your uh, feedback and your participation as a community. Thanks for watching everybody. Stu and I will be back uh, at Edge, IBM Edge, and we're at- uh, Dell EMC World. World. And we'll be at Dell EMC World. And Amazon reInvent. And reInvent and numerous shows this fall. So look for theCUBE, check out the at theCUBE handle. Uh, go to siliconangle.tv for uh, all the upcoming shows. Go to siliconangle.com for all the news, and of course, wikibon.com for all the research. Thanks for watching, everybody. We'll see you next time.